What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bootleg Football Podcast, where we still, 11 weeks into the NFL season, have no idea who is good and who is bad. It's been that kind of year. It's been a crazy season, an entertaining season, but uh, yeah, I, I'm struggling to figure it out. We're going to try to recap uh, all the good, the bad, and the somewhat very grotesquely ugly of week 11 on this show. But before we get into all that, EJ, my wonderful co-host, uh, how are you doing, bud? And what are you drinking tonight? I'm excited. We're, we're getting to the stretch run of the season. We're getting good football. It might not, eh, it's definitely not the football we expected. I was going to say it might not be the football <laughs> we expected. It's definitely not the football we expected, but it's been wildly entertaining. And we're back to having crazy close games in prime time and uh, got away from that for a couple of weeks, and it's been nice to return to that. So, And this week's slate, the upcoming week, looks um, really interesting from a lot of angles, and the football fan in me is just really psyched about that. Uh, but uh, I brought on another one from San Juan Brewing, San Juan Island Brewing Company. This is their uh, Island Fur Double Red IPA, um, which is really good stuff. And comes in a big can, a uh, little on the bitter side for those of you that maybe don't like IBUs. It's 80 IBUs, uh, but it is 8% and it's a 16 ounce can. So we might get some takes on this show. Uh, what do you have? <laughs> uh, I have probably the most California beer you can imagine from Stone, one of my favorite breweries down here in the Southwest. This is the uh, Buena Vesa, which is the salt and lime lager, one of the most eminently drinkable beers I think I've ever had in my life. And uh, we love Buena Vista. And they finally just started selling it in stores, in bottles. So we picked up like a 24-pack because it's finally available. So we could do that. It's like my wife's favorite beer too. So uh, yeah, good times here on the Bootleg Football Podcast. Before we get into our three up, I want to thank Thomas, Ricardo, Tyler, Caden, who joined on as an executive producer at $50 a month. So thank you especially to you, Caden, uh, for contributing to the show, believing in us. We really, really appreciate it. As well as Uzer, who all joined the Patreon this week. And remember, for all of you that did join the Patreon, regardless of what level you joined at, you all get discounts on merch over in the merch store, whether you're getting the beanie, whether you're getting the new hoodie. Uh, EJ is actually wearing the new one that we just started selling, I believe, this week. Uh, you all get discounts uh, on that over in the store, so if you're interested in that, check that out. And uh, one more thing before we get to talking about Vikings Packers, because we put this at the top of the show notes for a reason. We didn't want it to get lost. If you remember, a while back ago, EJ has told several stories about the Be More guy at, uh, at Buffalo Wild Wings, his local Sunday watering hole. EJ finally met the Be More guy. His name is Ron. Tell us all about him. Yeah, it was perfect. It was Bears Ravens. So we're both in the same place for the same reason. And uh, I've told stories about him before. He's pretty awesome. I thought, man, I, I just got to go up and say, hey, you know, I appreciate what you do. And, and who are you? And so I walked up and introduced myself. Uh, his name is Ron. The Be More guy is no longer going to be known as the Be More guy. He's Ron. Uh, he's a Baltimore native. Grew up, loves the Ravens, loves the Orioles. Uh, sorry about that, Ron. Um, but it was great to get to meet him. And I just, I said, why do you do it? You know, why do you, you know, he comes dressed every week. He's got his jersey. He's got his big Baltimore Ravens chain. He's jumping up and down when they celebrate, jumping around Buffalo Wild Wings, yelling B more at the top of his lungs. And he said, Hey, there's not many Ravens fans out here. Um, I didn't feel like I really had anybody to hang out with. And if I want, I want anybody that walks in here that might be a Ravens fan to know that, you know, there's, there's some of their people here and just share the excitement for my team. There's a lot of West coast fans out here. They don't really know about Baltimore and, you know, it's just me trying to bring the excitement. And I just thanked him. We talked a little bit. Uh, I mentioned that he's uh, made appearances on the podcast before he said, Oh, give me the name, give me the name. And like five minutes later, he came over to my table. He's like, I just subscribed. So Ron is now a bootleg subscriber. He'll hear this. But uh, big ups to him for for just being there, supporting his team, uh, being a great fan, making a great atmosphere. And we had a lot of good conversation about what was not a great uh, 
Baltimore Chicago game, but uh, we could kind of look at each other and go, "Is your quarterback going to make a play?" Nah, is yours? <laughs> nah. Uh, so we had a lot of fun on Sunday, but it was great to meet Ron. Um, and just a shout out to all the fans out there who are supporting their team in whatever way. I don't care if you're going to a tailgate, going to your buddy's house, uh, sitting in your basement, uh, screaming and scaring your dog off the couch. Like it's all good, and it's all part of the league and the brand and and what we do. So appreciate that a lot. The NFL runs on people like Ron. They wouldn't survive without people like Ron. So shout out to him and all the other crazed sports fans that uh, that get at least some enjoyment out of watching a 16-13 quote-unquote football game <laughs> that he just had to endure. Uh, what was not a 16-13 quote-unquote football game, though, was a very, very exciting matchup between the Packers and Vikings, which... We, we've gotten a lot of, uh, I'll call it chatter from Vikings fans over Feedback. last month saying, you never you never talk about Minnesota. What's up with that? They're 5-5. Five and five. They're making a push for the playoffs. I think they actually are like the fifth or sixth seed right now. And you never talk about them. Well, we're talking about you now. You're going to lead off the show because I can't figure them out. Like there's a few teams in the NFL that have like an average – you know, like a 500 win loss record or somewhere in that neighborhood where it's like they're really good offense, inconsistent defense, really good defense, inconsistent, inconsistent offense, or, you know, they, they've sustained a lot of injuries or there's some weird like regressions to the mean going on. You know, there's something that you can point to where it's like, this is why they're 500. With the Vikings, pretty much every aspect of their team is so dead average statistically that they are like the perfect personification of a 500 football team. Somebody who can beat anybody or lose to anybody in any given week. Pretty much every one of their games always comes down to the last possession. I think like their average uh, difference in score is like three points or something like that from week to week. Like it's crazy how all their games are super close because the team itself is like dead in the middle in so many different categories. You look at one of my favorite stats which I feel is a great representation of the the overall quality of an offense or defense. It's called drive success rate. And this is basically the percentage of a series of downs that either converts to another first down or is a touchdown. And the higher the drive success rate, statistically, the better pretty much every other offensive category is going to be. Scoring, um, you know, yards, yards per play, all that kind of stuff. Like drive success rate is like a really good overall, like, are you good or are you not? They are 15th in defensive drive success rate, 19th in offensive drive success rate. So they're a little bit inconsistent on offense. They are top five in terms of turnover margin per game. They don't really give the ball away at all. They only have six turnovers on the year, which is pretty crazy. But they're seventh most in penalties at about 7.2 per game, which is not good at all. They're 25th in adjusted line yards per carry at 3.96, which for a run first team is not where you want to be. But because both of their running backs are so ridiculously good at breaking tackles, Dalvin Cook is fourth in the NFL at 35. Madison is in the top 25 himself as a backup at 16. They're so good at breaking tackles that they're still 11th in rushing, despite the fact that their offensive line, statistically, is not very good at run blocking. And then you've got, you know, Justin Jefferson, who's amazing. And you've got Kirk, who's not turning the ball over, but he's really not passing the ball down the field as much as you want him to. So I feel like Justin Jefferson's being underutilized. This is one of the few games where he like really got going early and then just completely took it over, but we haven't really seen that a lot this year. So overall, like both statistically and when you watch the film on this team, they are so cripplingly average in so many different ways that I think that they can both beat anybody in the NFL and be beaten by anybody in the NFL. So I I don't know how to project them going forward. Like, I, I both trust and don't trust them at the same time. And if I'm a Vikings fan, it's probably the same kind of feeling where, like, I'm infuriated because I want to buy in, but I'm still, I'm still a little bit hurt, and I don't know if I can yet. This is the perfectly Midwest team, right? This is not <laughs> East Coast. This is not West Coast. They're they're right in the middle, right? They're right where they should be. And 
it is frustrating for Vikings fans. I talked to a lot of Vikings fans as a division rival, and they are like, come on, do this every week. Because we saw this week they went toe-to-toe with the clear division leader, the team that has won the division more times than any other in the last 10 years. And they flat out beat them because they had one of those weeks where everything went well. You talked about Justin Jefferson. I got to Buffalo Wild Wings about five minutes to go left in the first quarter of the early games. And the stat came up on the screen that Justin Jefferson had 100 yards. And I was like, oh, is he averaging 100 yards a game? Like, why does it say that? And I was like, no, he has 100 yards today. In the 10 minutes it took you to get from your house to here, Justin Jefferson has over 100 yards on three catches and a touchdown in the first quarter. And I was like, oh, it's going to be one of those days. (laughs) It's going to be the Kirk Cousins I'm on a heater day. Um, But they're really frustrated because this is kind of the Mike Zimmer Minnesota Vikings experience, right? They're that team that we talked about this before we started recording. They're just good enough not to get blown up, right? Because they're like, hey, we beat the Packers. We straight up beat the Packers this week. That's the best team in our division. And if we can beat them, we can go to the playoffs. We have all this talent. Yes. And if you're Vikings fans, it, it gets really frustrating. Like, do we kick Zimmer out and start over? Right, Because we're sort of stuck in this middle no man's land where we're always going to beat some teams, but we're always going to fall to some teams we shouldn't. That's a very frustrating piece to have, and it is that team that's just good enough not to get blown up, so you get stuck in purgatory. And I just, it's one of those things where you can feel good about beating the Packers, but at the same time, you also have to like qualify it in the back of your head. It's like, Aaron Rodgers had a toe injury. He was limping around. He was in a lot of pain. They didn't have Sedarius Smith, Jair Alexander, uh, Elton Jenkins, unfortunately, tore his ACL. You don't have David Bakhtiari. They're down to like 40% of their starting offensive line. Aaron Jones was out. Like they're dealing with so many injuries themselves. Like it wasn't even the full Packers. And they took them to the mat. Like they, they won last minute. By three points, they allowed 31 points to a very banged up Packers team. So it's like, man, I want to feel good about it. But at the same time, it's like that wasn't even the Packers Packers. That was like 60% of the Packers or at least what 60% of what the Packers could be. So it's like I, I want to have faith in it. Like they have a lot of talent themselves. And I know the Vikings are dealing with some injuries on their end too. Like they, I, I think that they're down both of their starting defensive tackles going into this week. Like they are not a pinnacle of health either. I get that, but I'm, I'm so afraid to get hurt again because I bought into the Vikings so many times. I'm like, look at the talent, look at the quarterback. They're going to be okay. And then it always comes back to bite me. So I'm just kind of in Minnesota sports fan mode right now where I'm just going to let it play out. I won't get too emotional either way. We'll see where we're at in like week 16. Hope for the best. And, uh, you know, all my Vikings fans, friends that listen to this podcast, just don't get too invested either way until we get to the playoffs and see where we're at because I I just don't trust it. And if it goes bad, I mean, you can go ice fishing, eh? I mean, there actually is pretty good fishing up in Minnesota, not going to lie. Absolutely, but the quarterbacks in this game, I mean, yeah, Aaron Rodgers is banged up and you say it's not the Packers. Aaron Rodgers for a lot of the past decade has been the Packers, right? And if Aaron Rodgers is on the field, they have a chance to beat anybody. And if Aaron Rodgers isn't on the field, it kind of doesn't matter. They're not, you know, that game is a toss-up at best. And even for being, quote-unquote, banged up, the quarterbacks in this game went for 23 completions for 385 yards and four touchdowns and 24 completions, 341 yards and three touchdowns. Do you know whose is whose? You know, Kirk tends to play pretty well in Green Bay games. Like, I was not surprised that that he kind of held up against Aaron because he usually plays pretty well against Green Bay for whatever reason, even though Green Bay's had borderline elite defense over the last you know six seven weeks like I went into this game smashing the over because I was like yeah Kirk just he's good against them I'm, that actually was the one thing that wasn't surprising to me 
Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns. And again, this is what Cousins can do. He can go on a heater and have a stat line that you can confuse in the very same game with Aaron Rodgers. And that's not many quarterbacks in the NFL. If you can't tell which one's Rodgers and which one's the other quarterback, you had a good day, typically. Uh, the other thing that just caught me about this game was the scoring symmetry, right? This You said just eked out a win. This was the musical chairs game of an NFL game, right? Somebody just ran out of music and didn't get a chair at the end because the first quarter, three to nine, right? The Vikings score nine, the Packers score three. Second quarter, seven and seven. Third quarter, seven and seven. Fourth quarter, crunch time now. We're only separated by six points. The Packers put up 14, threaten. Vikings put up 11, win by three at the last minute for anybody that watched the game. Like that kind of, I'll give you the ball. What are you going to do with it? Score. I'll give it back. What are you going to do? Score. And somebody just ran out of time at the end. uh, And it was the Packers. All credit to the Vikings. They played an amazing game. They kept their foot on the gas. And they ended up winning a big divisional game. But I'm with you. I'm not betting folding money on the Vikings next week or probably any week after that because you're just not sure who's going to show up. They play up or down to their competition as much as any team in the NFC. And I would say equally as much as a team like the Steelers, which is famous for playing up or down depending on their opponent. The Vikings feel like the sort of NFC version of that to me. Well, you know who they play this week. The, the other NFC team that can't decide if they're good or not, the 49ers. So uh, if you bet anything on this game, either way, you are fucking insane. Like, I am staying so far away from this game because I can't figure out either team. And if you are going, like, head first into this yeah, line, you know something you're, we you're don't. braver than me. Yeah, it's yeah. just, it's... It's pure insanity that this is a, a week 11 game that I'm at, or a week 12 game, I should say, that I'm actually looking forward to watching just out of like the, the sheer curiosity of like, who's good and who's not? I don't know. Like we're, you know, three who's going to show up today? Flip a coin <laughs> because that's what it is. It's like both of these teams, you're right, are teams that can beat anybody on any given Sunday or get beat. And one of them is going to have to lose and it might it's be gonna a It's going to be very- a tie. <laughs> it's going to be a tie, I guarantee you. Maybe. Maybe. And it's going to be like one of those really weird ties where it's like 19-19, and you're like, how do we get to that? Sc-? You know what? Don't even doesn't even matter. This week's show is brought to you by Manscaped. With the holiday season finally in full swing, Manscaped has everything you need both to get yourself ready for all those family gatherings, and they have plenty of stocking stuffers for all the other men in your life that, um, let's say, could use a little help. Whether it's the super strong waterproof lawnmower 4.0 trimmer that has skin safe technology to avoid all those painful nicks and cuts in your nether region, or their huge catalog of other grooming products like their moisturizer, ball deodorant, or colognes, they offer anything and everything you could ever need. Plus, just recently, Manscaped has also launched two new products, their ultra-premium body wash that is infused with aloe vera and sea salt, and their two-in-one shampoo and conditioner that can hydrate your scalp and strengthen your hair at the same time. There's a lot of great gifts in the Manscaped collection, either for yourself or for others, so if you're interested in checking out all they have to offer, you can use promo code BOOTLEG20 for 20% off your order, plus free shipping. Again, that is code BOOTLEG20 for 20% off your Manscaped order, including free shipping. And with that, let's get back to the show. Um, One other point that I want to make before we get out of this game. We've talked about the Packers a lot this season, but somebody that we haven't talked about in that building is Nathaniel Hackett, who is not getting the head coach buzz that a lot of other you know, offensive coordinators around the league tend to get year over year, you know, the Brian Dables of the world, we're, you know, we're hearing the, the war drums for, for Eric bien for the fourth straight year of everybody saying like, why isn't he getting a job? And, you know, we're sitting here like, we don't know, but every single year it's like the same names come up over and over and over again. And Nathaniel Hackett's not one of them. When you look at, you know, what he's doing in Green Bay, like, I, I feel like, you know, LaFleur maybe gets a, a disproportional amount of credit for w- what's going into this offense. Because remember, LaFleur's the head coach. He has his hands in everything. He's not 
he's not the sole owner of this offense schematically or game planning wise. And like, I know both of them don't get as much credit as maybe they should because their quarterback is Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron does a lot for both of them. But at the same time, you look at Nathaniel Hackett's history, even when he wasn't with LaFleur and when he wasn't with Rodgers, and he's had success pretty much everywhere he's been. You know, when he was with the Jaguars, he got, he got a, a Blake Bortles-led offense to be at, you know, top five in efficiency. Um, you know, he when he was with the Bills, he had success. When he was with Syracuse, a school that you're very familiar with, they were like a top five offense in college when he was with Syracuse. So everywhere he's gone, and he's a, another one of these guys that has like pure West Coast roots and everything like that, but everywhere he's gone, he's been one of the better play callers in his given league. And yet he just gets no credit, no buzz, no anything for head coaching opportunities, I think because of where he is. Everybody's so focused on the floor and so focused on Rodgers when... You know, all along, I almost kind of liken him to like the Frank Reich of the Packers, where it's like there was a noticeable difference in the Eagles offense when Frank Reich left. You know, everybody was given credit to to Wentz and everybody's given credit to Peterson and then Reich left and everything completely fell apart. I'm not saying that everything would fall apart if he left the Packers, but, you know, sometimes there's there's more than one guy behind the curtain that makes everything work. And I kind of feel like Nathaniel Hackett's that guy. And I really hope that he gets a lot of interviews in this, you know, coaching hiring cycle, because in my opinion, he deserves it. He does. And it is that there's a lot of optics here. Uh, Lafleur is a very hands on, very offensive centered head coach. And as a fan of a division rival that has a very similar sort of structure. Right. This is the Matt Nagy argument before this year that. He was the guy. He had the play sheet. He was calling it. Nobody really knew what the quarterback's coach did. Nobody really knew what the passing game coordinator did. Nobody really knew what the offensive coordinator did because Nagy was calling the plays. So what does that leave them? Oh, it's a collaborative effort. And what gets lost in the wash is I bet most fans, I bet even a few Packers fans, but I would bet most fans, even in the NFC North, couldn't name Nathaniel Hackett as the offensive coordinator of the Packers. It's that sort of incognito for him. You're right. He's had success wherever he goes. Uh, It is going to be hard because a lot of the NFL at that level um, in terms of like, strangely enough, pro bowl voting and like head coaching opportunities are all about the sort of prime time visibility. Did you make a play on the Monday night game? If you're going to the pro bowl and are you the guy with the play sheet that, you know, the NBC crew is focusing on, on Sunday night, with the camera and saying, oh, Nathaniel Hackett's calling the plays for Aaron Rodgers, right? He doesn't even get that. Like, that's why most people, I think, probably couldn't name him as the offensive coordinator of the Packers. If you said, who's the OC of the Packers? People would say Lafleur. It's like, well, he's the head coach. And, you know, de facto, maybe he is, but who's got the title? And everybody'd be like, "Ah, ah, hmm." it'd be pretty hardcore (laughs) Packers fans to be like, Nathaniel Hackett. But I'm with you. He's one of those guys. And there's a lot of these guys, let's be honest, around the NFL that don't get head coaching consideration, although they have long tenures, histories of success wherever they go. I always think of Dave Tobe in Kansas City, who's the special teams coordinator and was the special teams coordinator under Lovey in Chicago and has just people make an argument for special teams coaches. John Harbaugh famously was a special teams coach because they know the entire roster. They know the offense. They know the defense. They have to relate to everybody and a lot of times make do with whatever's left in terms of roster decisions on Sunday. It it is, some would say, pretty good training to be a head coach, but special teams coaches very rarely get an interview in the head coaching process because there is not that face recognition. There is not that sort of flash that you need in that process. And Hackett, I think, is absolutely a victim of that. I, I hope, like you do, that he at least gets a sniff because I'd be really interested to see how much of that baking of the offensive pie in green bay is is left up to him and what his ideas are but i i'm not sure he will because it's it is driven by at that level visibility image um and who's your agent yeah that's that's (laughs) well i didn't mention that part but that's a big deal it's a massive part of it trust me that's a big um three up number two we got to talk about jonathan taylor just completely running over a very 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 good Bills defense. He is, 
uh, you know, we, we, we talk about like, oh, Nick Chubb is the best pure runner in the NFL. I'm I'm thinking it's a 1A, a 1B, and a 1C situation now. Healthy Nick Chubb, healthy Derrick Henry, healthy Jonathan Taylor. Order them however you want. I don't care. But when all of them are on the field, the offense is different. Like whatever offense they're in is just different. And he's one of these guys where it, it's not just a, a pure physicality thing like like Derrick Henry where he's going to run over you and then run away from you. Like he can run over you with power, but he can also just flat out make you miss. He can burn your angle. He's a good pass protector. He's a good receiver. That was like one of the quote unquote holes in his game coming out of college. He's clearly worked on that too. He's a complete back in every sense of the word. And, you know, people are kind of dismissing, um, you know, his his MVP candidacy because they're like, oh, well, he wouldn't be this good without his offensive line. And I I understand that. But at the same time, like the Colts who started out, what, one and four, you think they're they're five and five now and in prime position to make a run at the AFC South lead after starting out like four games back. You think that they would be anywhere close to that without Jonathan Taylor, like offensive line or not? Hell no. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, good backs get yards, great backs get everything. He gets everything. And I just, I think he, he really needs his due as inarguably a top three running back in the NFL and uh, a legitimate, in my opinion, MVP candidate. Yeah, all right. I'm going to have my Beastie Boys moment here. I'm going to be, let me clear my throat. Because uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about Jonathan Taylor. I put out a tweet on Sunday that said, if you don't have Jonathan Taylor on your MVP ballot, you need a new ballot. Right? And it's not that he's the winner. He has to be in the list of people being considered. And People came out of the world, oh, it's for quarterbacks. I know it's for quarterbacks. I've followed the NFL for a long time. I understand the reality. Just what you talked about. Would the Colts be in the position they were in if Jonathan Taylor was not their running back, offensive line or not? And the answer is probably not. They probably drop a couple of those games because Taylor is all world everything. And he was. And he reminds me a little bit in this discussion we're having right now of Justin Herbert and that's a guy that you're very familiar hmm. with that didn't get utilized in a way in college that showed all of his pro traits. And that was a bit of the downfall with your scouting report on Herbert was, hey, they've got him in a screen-based offense. I'm not seeing the verticality. Like he comes in to the NFL and Herbert starts throwing deep and he's brilliant at it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Taylor's the same way. He didn't catch passes in college. Not his fault, not the offense, right? Not that he can't catch passes, it's that he didn't catch passes. But he had everything else, right? This is a guy that um, Paige DeMacos, who's the the CEO of Draft Network, said, I can't, I can never forget seeing this guy at the XO set up at the Combine. He's an absolute unit, right? He can, you know, squat 600 pounds. He famously ran, I think, a 10-400 in track, like he's fast he's big he's physical he's crazy strong he makes great cuts now there was the knock oh he doesn't he doesn't catch the ball and i got that exact question on sunday everybody was like hey you say nick chubb is the best pure runner in football like where would you put taylor and i'm like he has ascended this year last year uh uh-uh. uh he he was getting his legs under him he was starting to understand the pro offense this year he is the all everything he is pass protecting he is catching passes he is breaking long runs he is running hard through the middle this is not a guy that is just a speed guy a track guy Uh uh-uh he's way too big for that he'll break tackles he has elevated his game to where he has absolutely pushed his name into that conversation of the top three derrick henry is derrick henry like there is no other derrick henry derrick henry is unique there's nobody that big, that fast. In every power. way, yeah. Yeah, he's just <laughs> unique. Chubb is a tremendous runner who also pass protects very well. Not as big in the passing game, but as a pure runner, I've said over and over again on the show, he is right up there at the top of the league. I think he's the best pure runner. Doesn't mean he's the best running back overall. 
But Taylor has to be considered with those two now because of where he's pushed his game to this year and the results that he's having. And he has powered the Colts. This is the Colts team that we were sort of unsure about in the first month of the season. They roll themselves into Orchard Park on a terribly, uh, I would say, average November day in Orchard Park. It is blowing sideways. It is cold. There's a little bit of precipitation. This is like football weather outside if you dig that kind of thing. And Indianapolis runs over Buffalo. I mean, flat out steamrolls them. To the point where they put up 264 yards rushing on the Bills. They only put up 106 passing, and they win going away. Like, yeah, <laughs> that is a. Jonathan, they didn't. They didn't need the passing yards. That's the thing. They just didn't throw because they didn't have to. Like they put up 264, and the majority of that is Taylor. It's spread around a little bit because the Colts have other good backs. They have Naheem Hines. You know, we've talked about their backups being some of the best in the NFL. Didn't matter. Like Jonathan Taylor is the 1A now. He is very much what I think J.K. Dobbins would be in the Ravens running game this year. Again, same draft class. Like oh, if he had I stayed. Totally healthy. forgot about Dobbins. Oh, right. Man. But I had Dobbins ranked above Taylor by one tick. Like. I can't were, remember where I had them, but I think they were in the same tier. Yeah, where it was one of those where it's like I don't even care which one. Like you know, like this is your bubble. Good. This is your tier. Yeah. This is your however you do scouting. And I had I had Taylor right after Dobbins because I thought Dobbins was a little bit more well rounded, both in pass catching and pass protection, just because of largely again the offense he played at Ohio State. That's a lesson for us as evaluators, saying don't judge a player on just what he's done because of where he was, but what he might be able to do. Um, Taylor has absolutely ascended and deserves every consideration for, you know, MVP. And the Colts would not be in the same place. They waxed what we thought was an AFC favorite. Waxed them at home by yeah. just running the ball. That is not the modern NFL. Certainly, if you listen to this podcast, you don't think it is. They did it. Like they won convincingly and largely on the strength of Jonathan Taylor's running. I also want to give credit to the Bills, or not the Bills, <laughs> the Colts defense, which yep. <laughs> uh, last few years under Matt Eberflus has been kind of like one of those low key good units where like everybody knows they're good, but until they like watch them play, they're like, man, these guys are like really good. You know, it's it's very much a a the the, the what, what's the phrase the sum is greater than the parts you know type defense where they have very few like true superstars like DeForest Buckner is probably the biggest name that everybody knows Darius Leonard is the name that everybody knows but like it's so much more than just them you know you have honestly their, their defensive line is seven guys deep like Edge, DT, like Grover Stewart to me, one of the most underrated nose tackles in the entire league. There's a lot of fans that are not Colts fans that probably wouldn't even know his name, but, I mean, he makes an impact. Like, Quiddy Pay really hit the ground running as a pass rusher. Um, you know, over the first nine, ten weeks of the year, he was the highest, uh, highest rookie in terms of pressures per game. So he's been fantastic, really been a good pick for them. Like, they don't even have... Dio back yet to my recollection like I don't no, even he think is. He's, he's back he came back did two he just weeks play ago. two weeks ago okay. he came back two weeks ago and he had like a couple of warm-up snaps and then last week he actually had some impact plays and I was like oh oh because Dio was one of those guys that scouted pretty early in the process with Craig Stout and we were like yeah and literally the day after Craig and I stayed up all night scouting him he tore his Achilles and we were like oh shit because I knew they they activated him a few weeks ago. I didn't realize he was already getting snaps in games. He got snaps. So that's, two, first snaps so were that's two the weeks eighth ago. Guy, the eighth yeah. guy in the rotation. <laughs> the crazy thing is they had a really good line, really good defensive line last year. We talked about that over and over again. How yeah. man, the Colts are pressuring people with Buckner and everybody else on the line. And then they come out in the draft, and we both scratched our heads a little bit when they went defensive line, defensive line with the first two picks, and we were like, uh. That was like the strongest part of your team. I mean, if you don't want to say offensive line, like it's one of the top two units on your team and you just, you took your top two picks and put more coins in the coffer. Like, oh, okay. Like, all right. 
I, Chris- I really questioned it at the time because their plan at left tackle at the time was, I think, Julian totally Davenport. And I was like, what? What are you like, doing? And you're, and you're going back-to-back defensive line, and like they were resting their entire hopes and dreams on Eric Fisher coming off Achilles. And I was like, this is fucking insane. But it worked. Like, I'm eating crow to this oh, day. Chris, it Chris Ballard. it fucking like, worked. <laughs> we, we both went, what are you doing? Like, you can go back and watch the live stream. It's on the bootleg channel. Go ahead. Um, you know, through the first two picks, we were like, okay, those are both good players. Nothing against Quiddy Pay, nothing against Dow, but Dow's a risk because of the injury. Quiddy Pay's absolute stud. Great. But what? Do you, where's the offensive lineup? Like, what are you doing? Chris Ballard's like, Hang on, guys. I got it. Yeah. Who knew Eric Fisher in the back pocket was going to be the answer to all of their problems? And then Chris Ballard? (laughs) Yeah. Chris Ballard? That's why he's a GM and we're not because he's pretty pretty good at this. Uh, But, I mean, again, it's it's not a no-name defense because, again, DeForest Buckner's a superstar. Darius Leonard's probably one of the more recognizable names at linebacker. But it's all the other guys. It's the Bobby Okarikis of the world. Um you know, it's it, Rocky Sin, I think, is playing better this year than he did earlier in his career. Xavier Rhodes, I think, is playing better um, than at least certainly his last days in Minnesota. I think he's had uh, a much better time in Indy. I'm not saying he's back to being like prime Rhodes, but he's he's certainly been better in Indy. Um, Kenny Moore at nickel, I think, has been really good for them. So it's like it's a bunch of these guys that like. You know, people might struggle to name off the tip of their tongue, but when you combine them into an overall unit, they're holding the Josh Allen led Bills to 300 total yards and 15 points in their own house and forcing two turnovers because Josh was getting frustrated on third and long because they, they couldn't move the chains or move the ball in early downs. And so it's like third and 18, he's throwing into double coverage and getting picked off. And then it gets to like 31 and seven or 31 to seven, I should say. Uh, I think it was like late in third quarter. And again, he's getting frustrated because they're just not giving him any of those deep shots he wants. And he's throwing it again into double coverage and it's a tip drill. It's another pick. And like, they just frustrated the shit out of him and they couldn't do anything. And so I want to give credit to the Colts defense. It's, it's very much a defense that's greater than the sum of its parts. And one of the reasons why, particularly with the Derek Hen- Henry injury, looming long term why if i was going to bet on any afc south team over the last seven eight weeks of the year to you know to win the division and make a run here probably the colts it's a suffocating performance at when you run the ball down somebody's throat and i mean run the ball down somebody's throat they know it's coming and you just run them over and I, I made the tweet that their running game really is a thing of beauty right now. It is not just the fact that they have a ton of athletes. They have Quentin Nelson. They've got an all-world athlete at running back who's playing at a very high level. They're doing athletes, play calling, and execution better than anybody. And this is one of the things you get when you go to a place like Buffalo Wild Wings where all the games are up or when we were in Caesar Sports Sportsbook and all the games are up, right? You can just sort of be looking oh they're on timeout i'm gonna look over here and i look over to the next screen over and it's the colts run game and i'm like oh that's gorgeous look at oh like run after run and they from the very first drive they ran it down the bill's throat and they out executed them and they just flat out ran them over and i said i put in a tweet like the colt run game right now is a thing of beauty and our buddy brandon thorne who is an offensive line expert it's on the Joe Moore Award uh, committee this year. Shout out to Brandon. Put the same thing out with video on Monday and said, man, this is pretty. Like, this is art, right? They're they're combining this concept, this concept, outside zone, the wham blocks. Like, it's all working. Like, this is, and it is. It's just, and you can notice that. Just, just turn to the screen and go, oh, that doesn't look like my team's run game. Like, that's <laughs> pretty. And this is a football team that's built defense and a run game which is kind of an old school philosophy but they went outdoors in buffalo in crappy weather and mashed them just flat out mashed them into the turf and yeah if you're gonna bet on a team down the stretch it seems like a fairly safe bet and the defense is doing it without one of their best playmakers and julian blackman who got hurt early in the year god can you imagine how good they'd be with him i mean 
shit. It's a good team, man. It's a sneaky good team. Sneaky Not, good team. Have you to know, say. it's. I don't think they have a lot of primetime games this year. If I, off the top of my head, I think they had like two primetime games scheduled or something like that. If they had more primetime games, I think they would be getting a little bit more national recognition because they're one of those teams that nobody wants to play. Not right now. This week's show is also brought to you by Mac Weldon, creators and curators of the Daily Wear system. The Daily Wear system is a selection of clothes rooted in smart design that are all made with super high performance fabrics, and they can all work together to get you through your day. Whether it's with their super breathable t-shirts and polos, their button-ups, or their famous underwear and beyond, Mac Weldon makes it easy for you to dress for work or the fun you have after work. Down here in Southern California, where the temperatures drop to a positively frigid 52 degrees in November, it's back to being jacket season. So I've been throwing on my Ace Full Zip hoodie almost every day. But if hoodies aren't your style, but you still want to stay warm, they also have cashmere crew necks, they have puffer vests, or for all you Pacific Northwesterners like EJ, they have the Storm Chaser jacket that is built for even the wettest of holiday weather. If anything in the Mack Weldon catalog interests you, either for yourself or as a gift for someone you love this season, you can use promo code BOOTLEG at MacWeldon.com slash BOOTLEG for 20% off your order. Again, that is promo code BOOTLEG at MacWeldon.com slash BOOTLEG for 20% off your order. Thank you again to Mack Weldon for sponsoring today's show, and let's get back to it. Uh, and speaking of teams that nobody wants to play... Uh, is there any defensive coordinator on planet Earth that sees a matchup with Justin Herbert on the schedule and says, yeah, I'm looking forward to that? I mean, we're talking no. a 6'5", 230-pound freak of nature that can rip off long runs if you dare to play man coverage against him. He can hit whole shots that five human beings on planet Earth can hit. Uh, three even, you know, if we're, if we're going off your account. I mean, some of the throws he makes are, they're stupid, but because he is Justin Herbert, they're not stupid. Because every quarterback coach would be like, you never throw this ball. You never, ever, ever throw this deep seven with a defender over the top and a defender underneath. Like, you're, you're going to get picked every time from the far hash. Don't fucking do it. But Justin Herbert, when you're built like him and you have his kind of arm, there is literally no throw that he can't make. And it's it's so it's not even like it's ill advised because he's Justin Herbert. It's one of those like you can do whatever you want when you're that kind of of physical talent. Like I'm, I truly believe that he is more talented than Patrick Mahomes. And Chiefs fans, don't turn off the show yet. I understand that might sound like sacrilege to you, but he has a stronger arm than Pat Mahomes. He is faster than Pat Mahomes in terms of like you know, the throwing off platform and the crazy arm angles and the no look stuff like Mahomes does more wow plays, if that makes sense. But in terms of like, I'm going to sit in this pocket and just fucking rip it. I have seen maybe three arms in my lifetime that compete with Justin Herbert. Plus, he's really accurate. Plus, he's a good decision maker. Plus, he can run. It's like it's like if Brett Favre was a more disciplined quarterback, and any any fan in the AFC that is not a Chargers fan should be terrified of that. Now, Justin Herbert right now is a god slash cheat code among quarterbacks. Like there is, I think he has the strongest arm in the league right now. And that's always a debate. Either like, him or Josh of, Allen. It's one yeah, of those two. Josh. And I mean, Justin Fields has a hose and there's always like four or five guys like Lamar can absolutely rip it. Mahomes got to be in the conversation. But like what caught me was Al Michaels, right? Al Michaels has seen a lot of football games, like a lot of football games. And he was slobbering. <laughs> over Justin Herbert. Like, if you listen to that broadcast, he's like, oh my God, like, how did he do that? Like, he turned Al Michaels into a slobbering fan, which is really hard to do. Al's a pro. He's seen a million games. Justin Herbert is making throws you don't really 
ever see. And you said Brett Favre, more discipline. I'll go one further and take like his release is not as quick. So before Dolphins fans jump all over me, Dan oh, Marino. God. You're, you're going Dan Marino. I am. Ooh. I'm going Dan Marino's <laughs> arm. And honestly, now nostalgia is going to take over Steve Young's legs. Oh, man. See, I don't know. Steve Young had more of like a crazy legs kind of running style and to him. Steve, but... Steve was more physical. I think he would be he was more prone to run through people. But like Justin Herbert had 90 yards. He led all rushers in the game, not on his team, all rushers in the game by 40 yards. Like Justin Herbert had more yards than anybody else in the game on the ground by 40 yards. He had 90 yards, 10 yards an attempt. Show me a running back that has 10 yards per attempt. There isn't That's one. They don't six, exist. Five, 230. Yeah, and he will take off and go. And some of the throws you see him make, the throw that you sent me and you're like, look at this, you never throw this between the defense. I was like, look at his feet. And this is a throw that he threw basically down the right middle seam, under defender, over defender, tiny window basically three guys converging and he sees it and he hitches his feet he stops he puts his front foot out stops and then goes yeah i'm gonna throw it anyways this is like a 25 yard line in between three converging defenders who are close and he throws it completely upper body hips up torque that's it because he stepped on his front foot and then he hitched and then he just went, I got it, and went, huh, and nailed the throw. No window, just absolute flat trajectory, like you said, accurate, right on target. Like, that throw should make you take your breath. That throw should make oh. you go, huh, what the, nobody can do that, and definitely not off a hitch. And he made it look effortless. And this is why Al Michaels was reduced to a slobbering fanboy is because Justin Herbert's just doing things that nobody else can do. And that's very rare because you're talking about all the top athletes on the planet. You're talking about Aaron Rodgers. You're talking about Pat Mahomes. You're talking about Josh Allen. You're talking about Lamar. You're talking about all these guys that are really, really, really physically gifted. Justin Herbert looks so smooth and easy doing things that are basically impossible that it's just your brain just kind of you just giggle right because your brain can't reconcile it you're like that's not possible <laughs> and he does it anyways he does it over and over again so when i say cheat code slash god at quarterback like you know if you're picking kind of the expansion draft this is the great question oh you're picking an expansion draft you know oh you, yeah he's number talent. one like he's number one he's got to be in the top five players in the nfl regardless of position he's got to be in that conversation yeah and, and i think he's, one was one bullet. for me i think one with a bullet just because of quarterback's importance and that could be aaron donald that could be Jalen ramsey that could be any of the top players at any position you got to look at a guy like justin herbert that can hurt you in so many ways that is playing poised that is playing like he's not just taking off to take off he's taking off when he should take off and then he's not going down he's full on sprinting and defenses are like oh wait he's big and we have to tackle him that might be a penalty but he's 35 yards downfield what should i do like it's a conundrum right and you said defensive coordinators at the top like who wants to play him right now anybody sane is like no yeah the chiefs fans are like man we just got control of the division <laughs> and then we got to deal with this guy. Yeah, it's it, he's insane. He's a problem. And he, you know, you mentioned uh, Dan Marino, who's one of the only three arms that I would have put up with him because you go back and watch Dan Marino highlights, and like that ball is a, it's a heater. Like Dan Dan had a gun, and he was quicker than anybody. That's the thing that's different than Herbert is. Herbert is very smooth. Like, I just use that to describe anything he does. His throws, yeah. his runs, his decision-making. He's poised. He's smooth. We we saw this guy. We got to talk to him on the field at the Senior Bowl. Like, he's really quiet. And everybody said, oh, leadership. Blah. 
screw you. <laughs> like just, <laughs> Justin Herbert can lead whoever he wants to. It's fine. When you play like that, people will follow you. And he is a good leader. He just happens to be quiet, but he is smooth. He is measured. Even his post game interview with Michelle Tafoya, he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. He said all the right things. He's just smooth. Whereas Marino, the one thing that sets Marino apart that I, we may never see again in our lifetimes is the that release, release. man. That release yeah. is just forget it. That was just like and, and that's why that's what made him special is like it wasn't just the velocity. It was the fact that it, it was the velocity and you can't hit him because the ball's out every single time. <laughs> the thing it was that a Herbert missile. does that's like that though is there were several throws even in this game where defensive backs were like he can't right i'm in good enough coverage i'm a yard and a half nah, off but no. i'm 35 yards deep at the sideline he ca- ah he did it he put it on the numbers how did he can't do that like defensive backs at some point have to let off and there were guys letting off 35 yards down the field like he can't go oh geez he got it here and that's herbert that's why he is what he is right now so moral of the story if you're ever wondering what it would look like if Dan Marino played with Brian Westbrook, watch Justin Herbert play with Austin Eckler, Eckler, and that's pretty much what it looks like because Austin Eckler himself is a man amongst boys. Receiver, runner, like you could talk about size all you want, his contact balance, his strength, his versatility. Uh, he when, when he signed his extension, both you and I were like, that's it? Like that's that's all it cost, and it, it, every single year since then, it, the the disparity between what he's worth and what he's making just continues to grow. He is one of the most valuable players on that offense, not named Justin Herbert, because of all the things he can do. And I'm really happy that he got to have that kind of game in prime time, where everybody could realize, like, damn. Austin Eckler is not just a fantasy football god. He is an actual bona fide stud on the field. Yeah, I I put out a tweet Sunday night that said, Sunday Night Football, a.k.a. the Austin Eckler Show. And that was when he had two touchdowns. Yeah, <laughs> and had two I to re- go. T- and I retweeted it when he had four and said, this seems appropriate, evergreen tweet. You know, the Austin Eckler Show. Like, Small size, but tremendous receiver, great blocker, great power between the tackles. Like, this guy is so strong. Chargers players will tell you, like, you should see him in the weight room. He does, like, crazy things. And you're like, "Mm, yeah, I get it when he's on the field. But one of those guys, you talked about a coach earlier that doesn't get any name recognition. A player earlier on the Colts defensive line that doesn't get any recognition. When you talk about top running backs, nobody ever mentions Eckler. Like, nobody mentions Eckler. It'll be, you'll be 15 or 20 backs deep before somebody goes, oh yeah, Austin Eckler. And you're like, "Uh -uh." like he should be in your top 10 if you're looking at production and looking what actually happens on the field. And again, he just, for whatever reason, uh, you know, draft status is forever. Brad Spielberger, who works for PFF, who's a friend of ours, says that like draft status is forever, right? Austin Eckler was not highly drafted, but he is highly productive, has been forever. And you talked about the difference between what he makes and what he's worth. If I could make that difference every year, I'm done. I retire. <laughs> like, I'm good. Just the, the difference in that actuality would be amazing. But he had a great game. He's a big part of this offense, rightfully so. He is so uh, just multi-featured, right? He can do whatever the offense needs whenever they need him to do it. And he got to go off. Touchdowns are kind of like sacks. They're a little fickle. They come in bunches. Really glad to see him get a bunch on a primetime game. Let's get to uh, three down number one. We'll keep it in the AFC West and talk about uh, the Raiders, who started out, as per usual, pretty damn good, and are now kind of experiencing the usual mid-season, late-season skid that seemingly they have every single year. Now, this year, obviously, a little bit different considering everything they've been through as a franchise, but... At the same time, going back-to-back weeks, putting up 16 points or less. Actually, that's incorrect. It's back-to-back-to-back weeks, putting up 16 points or less. So, 
apologize for my error. Uh, it's been 16, 14, and then 13. So they're going backwards. They're now five and five after starting the year five and two, if, if I'm doing my math correct. Three straight losses to the Giants, Chiefs, and Bengals. And I, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like some of the issues that we were worried about preseason that seemed alleviated in the first half of the year, uh, you know, receiver uh, top end, not receiver depth, but like top end receiver production. We're like, not sure if they have an alpha yet, but if you qualify Darren Waller, maybe they do. And, you know, the offensive line was a question. The defense, we felt they were more talented, but still wasn't sure they were all the way there. Um, you know, the John Abram thing is still happening, even though he's still struggling mighty mightily in coverage. They're still insisting on giving him a lot of snaps. And that's kind of frustrating to me personally, because I feel like they should just, you know, put him at linebacker and just make that official, because that's really where I think he's going to end up. So I, I just feel like a lot of the issues that we were worried about over summer have finally come home to roost. And now I'm not sure if they're going to be able to get out of this because you have a game against the Cowboys, which is winnable because the Cowboys are really banged up. You know, not going to have Amari Cooper, might not have C.D. Lamb. Tyron Smith, I think, might play, but he's not 100%. You know, Randy Gregory, like DeMarcus Lawrence, like they're dealing with a lot of stuff over in Dallas. So it's a winnable game. But at the same time, because of all the, no other way to put it, systemic issues with the Raiders roster right now, I still don't even have faith they're going to win that game. And then you're looking at like a four-game skid, and you're going to be under 500. And then you got games against Washington, another game against the Chiefs. You know, you got to finish off the year with the Colts that are red hot, and the Chargers who are just, like, I just, I don't know. I don't see a way out of this. And I, I feel bad because, like, they had a chance to kind of get ahead of that late season crazy gauntlet of a schedule. And I feel like they kind of squandered the opportunity. And now... I don't know. Is this another lost season? Because it kind of feels like it. Well, it is Thanksgiving week, and one of the great Thanksgiving cartoons of all times, Peanuts, right? Charlie mm -hmm. Brown. So we get back to the Charlie Brown football, right? And the Raiders season feels a little bit like Charlie Brown football, right? Lucy's like, no, I'm not going to pull it away. Go ahead. Kick it, Charlie. It's cool. <laughs> I'm not going to pull it away. Ah, uh, whoops. Uh, wham. And I feel like that with us, with the Raiders are like, we're like, no, they're super talented. They always come hot out of the gate. We said this in our divisional preview over the summer. And then two weeks ago, I said, I'm a little worried. Like, I'm a little worried that they're going to, they've only had one loss at this point, but I like, I'm a little worried that they're going to fall off. Like, I don't want them to fall off. And I don't Raiders fans. I was among you. I was in you week one, right? It was at Allegiant stadium. You're a tremendous fan base and you deserve more than this. You have a really talented team and every year they come out of the gate and they look like gangbusters for the last two, three years. They get to the, I swear to God, the midpoint of the season, which was two weeks ago. And I said, I feel, you know, I want them to turn the ship around. I don't want this to be the beginning of that slide. And now it. It really feels like the beginning of that slide. What is it, like and four or five years in a row that this has happened at the exact same time of the like year? It's like three years, and it feels like the Raiders, because of this, feel like the ultimate tape team to me, right? That defensive coordinators get tape on the Raiders by midseason, and they go, nope, we got it. We understand. It's a known known. We know how to beat them. We'll shut this down. We'll shut this down, and they'll just fizzle. And they do, and they don't sort of innovate or switch it's like it's like halftime adjustments except it's half season adjustments right and they don't make them and honestly if they lose to the cowboys that would be three in a row they would drop to five and six and then they have to face washington football team dangerous with taylor heineke the chiefs they've found themselves that's going to be a tough game's divisional game and the chiefs right now if i had to bet chiefs raiders right now today i'm betting chiefs not a question browns possibly winnable game browns have been very volatile up and down broncos mm, broncos kind of feel like they're kind of feel like they're feeling it they're feeling their stride i think they take yeah. the raiders Colts? that's the one where i like i I'm, I'm like i don't know it depends how how 
How oh, is for insert sure. Broncos quarterback playing? Because that's yes. literally what it comes down to. <laughs> they could win that game. That is one of those games. Colts, we just talked about Colts. They're losing to the Colts. If the Colts keep playing the way they're playing right now, the Colts are going to run all over them. Chargers, we just went on at length about Justin Herbert and Austin Eckler. And again, they could show up or not show up. Uh, Brandon Staley hasn't sort of nailed that consistency yet. But if I'm betting today after the, the weak performances they just had, I'm going Chargers. Like, it's not even close. So, yikes, that's two or three wins sprinkled in at best. They're a five-win team. That's a seven, possibly eight-win team. Yeah. Unfortunately, that sounds really familiar, right? You're, you're just back to at- picking in the middle of the round, and we're like, you're not high enough to get, you know, some crazy good top five talent. You're not in the playoffs. You're just You're just there. You're just in the middle again. So this is the mirror image of the Vikings. We talked about the Vikings at the top of the show, and they totally deserved it. They whooped the Packers' ass this week. Good for them. The The Vikings are sort of game to game, right? Up and down, up and down, could win, could lose. We talked about playing up or down tier competition. The Raiders are the AFC version of that. They're like the mirror version of the Vikings in the AFC, but they play like gangbusters for the first part of the season, and everybody goes, this is the year, and then they slide for the second half of the year and they end up at the exact same place as the vikings whereas the vikings kind of went up and down up and down all year the raiders went up and then down but they end up at the same place same kind of draft pick same kind of issues like your quarterback is really good and when he gets hot he can be anybody in the league you have receiving threats like all the kind of same issues bubble up and you end up with the sort of same result and it's like what do you do obviously the raiders have a coaching vacancy Mayock, I think, probably continues as GM, but it's a real pivotal piece for Raiders I, fans. I think they keep Mayock. They have to I, keep Mayock. I believe that they do with all the instability that they've had, but then they're, you know, an open coaching search. And, and uh, is that coach able to turn around what has become kind of a thing, like a tread path through the field for the Raiders, which is we're hot during the sort of summer months and early fall, and then we get to crunch time. And we fold like a house of cards. Like that's a hard thing to turn around organizationally. Like that's a that's a mindset change. That's a McDermott coming into the Bills organization and going, nope, we're not going to do what we did before. We're going to do things differently. It's a Stefanski coming into the Browns and going, I know you've had to change every two years. We're going to be solid. Forget that. Like that's a difficult thing to do and not everybody can do it. And the Raiders are going to have to find a guy that can. To bring the show full circle, Nathaniel <laughs> Hackett to the Raiders. <laughs> I don't uh, hate it. I don't hate I it don't at hate all. It. He's got some talent there. It's it's. Uh, there's a lot of culture change here, which is a tough thing to instill. People tend to believe that these things are kind of faded. I know that sounds weird as much change as there is in the NFL and as different as every team is every year. But boy, the Raiders have put together basically the exact same resume for the last three years, and that is a tough thing to shake. Uh, Three down number two. Let's talk about more resumes that just happen year after year. Do we Uh, have to? The Giants are... (laughs) We do. We do. Because we we talked about the Giants when they were doing well. We gave praise to Dave Gettleman. Now we have to do the other side of it when it doesn't work out. Um, It's over. Like that it game it should be. No, it that it's over. Be. I know they just fired Jason Garrett. I don't care. That was that was chumming the waters, you know, trying to get the sharks to go somewhere else. Like, it's over. Joe Judge is over. I like that the firing of Jason Garrett, which was deserved, but I mean he threw him so far under the bus in the postgame presser. He might as well have just said to the media, it's all his fault. It's his fault. It's not me. It's Jason Garrett. We're going to get rid of him. We're going to be fine. Please don't fire me. Like, that's that's exactly what that presser came off as. I don't think it worked because there's going to be a new regime there. Like, you look at the the Giants drafts over the last few years. They've they've got some nice pieces. All credit to, to Dave Gettleman. They've got some really nice pieces, especially on defense, but it's not been enough, and they missed on the quarterback. Like, we are now three years into the Daniel Jones era. He's averaging two turnovers a game. 
can we just admit it's not working? Like, not all the turnovers are his fault. I'm not. I'm not saying they are. But two turnovers a game for three years, it's not working. And so now you're you're going to hitch your wagon to him again with potentially a fifth year option, and and, and you're going to say, well, let's let's try this again, like. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Like, he's only cheap for two more years anyway. You have the fifth least amount of cap space going into 2022. You've got no money. Your quarterback situation's a mess. Again, you have some pieces, but it's not nearly a full roster. Your head coach is, in my opinion, not the guy. I don't know. I I just feel like a full reset's necessary. Like, they're going to have to completely gut everything like some teams have had to do in the past where it's like hey we're gonna strip cap you know we're gonna get a new coach we're gonna get a new gm we're gonna be really really bad and just build it from the ground up and i feel like they're gonna have to do that again get a new gm get a new coach get rid of every single toxic contract on that roster because there's plenty of them and just somehow do it all over again. There's a way around this, but I will start with your points and they are valid and they are not anything we haven't talked about for the last couple of years. The power structure in any modern NFL organization, quarterback, head coach, GM, one, two, three. You have to have all three. You can get by with two. If you don't have a quarterback, you're probably not getting by at all. But if you have a quarterback and one of the other two, you can probably get by. Maybe, like Dallas, you have a really good offensive coordinator. The head coach isn't as important. But you need to be bringing talent in and not signing terrible contracts. You need to be maximizing that talent. And then, look, you got to execute on the field. you got to be a guy that, in Daniel Jones's case, holds on to the ball. Like, we've talked about his struggles with turnovers And it's ludicrous. He has 65 in 37 games. If you had a running back that fumbled every game, like clockwork, like, oh man, he went out there and tossed it again. Like, we just give up one a week. Like, he would make it like 12 weeks. And then you would (laughs) bench him. And you'd be like, forever. You Yeah, you'd never play him again. Like, you chuck the ball once a week. That's totally unacceptable. Daniel Jones has chucked the ball twice a week for three years. With regularity. And yet, draft status is forever. He's a first-round pick. You hit your wagon to him. But, 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 he needs this. He needs that. He needs to be surrounded. I don't care. He's putting the ball on the ground twice a week. And the opposition's getting a majority of those. Not a way to win. So you need a quarterback, you need a head coach, you need a GM. The worst thing for the Giants is that they sweep two out of three. They say, we're not going to re-sign Daniel Jones, and we're going to ditch either Joe Judge or Gettleman. Like, whoever has more organizational It's got to be both. It can't just be one. But that would be the worst. That's what I'm saying, is they go, oh, well, it's the other guy's fault, just like you said at the press conference. Like, oh, is Joe Judge not maximizing talent? Daniel Jones putting the ball on the ground. But me, Dave Gettleman, I'm fine. You're not fine. You picked a running back in the top five. Go away. Like, that's <laughs> enough. You missed on the quarterback and you picked a running back in the top five. That's egregious. You, you just don't do that. So I agree with you that they need to say Daniel Jones is not the future. They need to say Joe Judge is a Patriots assistant. And there's one rule when you hire head coaches. What's don't that rule? hire a Patriots assistant. Don't hire a Patriots assistant. And Unless Dave Gettleman, their name is Brian Flores. He's the exception. He seems all right. Like, I give Brian Flores a chance to claw his way out of that reputation, but everybody else, not so much. And Gettleman, you got to say, look, over the balance of this thing, you've given us some talent. Absolutely. We praised Gettleman's draft last year. Uh, And he's gotten some good players, but overall, you're not getting it. And the contracts piece is also on the GM And he hasn't done well there either. So you can ditch some of those toxic contracts. You can get rid of Joe Judge, get somebody that is uh, an attractive head coaching candidate. Because look, it is New York City. And you can do one of two things. You can draft a quarterback and hope that they start to work out. They are still going to be a rookie quarterback. Or you can go all in on somebody like Russell Wilson. 
Russ isn't going to want to go there. Don't be so sure. It's a massive media market. He eventually wants to be an NFL owner. His wife would thrive in New York City. This is not a bad situation overall for Russell Wilson. I'm not saying he wants to go there, but their pieces aren't terrible. You get an offensive lineman, like to protect your blind they, side. They would, they would need to be getting like a rock star coach that he signs off on. Totally agree. Like, has to happen. I'm not saying Russ is going to the Giants. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the rebuild might not be as long as what you're saying, which is completely strip it down. Say no to Daniel Jones, get rid of Joe Judge, and strip Gettleman. In that case, that's a two and a half year rebuild. When you bring in, and we've seen it in Buffalo, in Cleveland, whatever, like that is a that's a two and a half year reset. If you go new coach, new GM, new quarterback, you're not winning anything if you're in the Giants' shoes for minimum two seasons, probably two and a half. If you are able to kind of reset one of those, you know, maybe it's a rookie head coach with a veteran quarterback, or maybe it's a not rookie head coach, a veteran offensive play caller from the offensive side that brings in their choice of whoever, because the Giants have two in the top 10. Like they have the Bears pick, right? So, they could go get whoever they like in this year's draft if they want to. And then maybe you jumpstart their process because the roster is not terrible. It is not great. It is not loaded. Gettleman has not done a great job. But that's the way to short circuit it. Other than that, it is it has to be a clean sweep. Like Joe Judge, not the guy. Gettleman, we know what he is. He's a known known. He's going to continue to do the things he does. And Daniel Jones just real it's the rocky thing throw the damn towel like don't keep getting it's over he's not a starting quarterback in the nfl so do the clean sweep but then pick your shots very carefully if you're the mara family because you can make this a two and a half year process or like a one and a half year process your choice uh three down number three we mentioned russ the reason why we mentioned russ as being an option is because seattle possibly has hit the rock bottom portion of the Pete Carroll era. Like if we're being honest, you know, what is it? 13 points total over the last two games. And I understand that Russ was coming off injury for the first one, but you got to average more than six and a half points over the last two weeks. And, you know, I I feel like some of their pieces just look old. Um, The team, doesn't seem what's a way to phrase this modern snappy exciting i'm just i'm trying to find a way like a nice way to say this i gotta give you one here so jackson bevins who goes by cigar thoughts on twitter uh he's part of field goals he's he's definitely part of seahawks twitter he said look i can abide three things right good and exciting I'm good with that. Boring and good. I'm also okay with that. Bad and exciting. (laughs) I can abide that too. It's fun. They've had some years of bad and exciting too. It (laughs) It creates entertainment and the NFL is entertainment. Any of those three combinations, I am good with. But boring and bad, I cannot abide. And the Seahawks are boring and bad and nobody should abide that like and Russ isn't going to anybody that thinks after all the noise he made about getting out, which was not just smoke. There was fire there. Last oh, that off was season. real. That yeah. was real. Yeah. If you think he's just going to go, no, run it back. It's cool. After this performance, like, look, the Seahawks are a three win team. In this section three down, we've been hammering Kyle Shanahan two out of the last three weeks, and rightfully so. That's a five-win team and should be better. Is improving, but should be better. The Seahawks are two games down to that in the division in last place. Like, this is the last gasp. We saw what the Seahawks looked like without Russ with the finger injury. If you think that the John Schneider... Pete Carroll combination without Russell Wilson and three first round picks is somehow magic beans. You haven't been watching the Seahawks draft success 
over the past three years, <laughs> he right? He said facetiously. Right. If you have three first round picks, so what? You got to use them well. So it really does feel like the full reset is coming because they're not super talented. And when you said not super modern, there's a stat out this week that DK Metcalf is has like the second highest success rate when targeted as a wide receiver in the NFL. <laughs> And how many targets does he Yeah, have? and they're targeting him like once a half. Like three weeks ago, they targeted him once in the first half. And he got like a 50-yard gain. And then they just stop. It was a touchdown. Was yeah, a touchdown. and then they just stop inexplicably. It's the weirdest thing to say, hey, the modern NFL requires a 1A alpha wide receiver. And look, we've got one. And oh yeah, over there's 1B. And Tyler Lockett could be a one on a lot of teams because he can win pretty much anywhere. And we're going to throw to them like a combination of like five targets a half. Like it just doesn't make any sense. So it does feel like it's grinding down. And really the question is who survives? Like Russ is probably leaving in the off season through a trade and the Seahawks will reap a bounty of draft picks and rightfully so for that. Who gets to use those? It feels like, look, Pete Carroll's the oldest coach in the NFL I don't think he's going to want to sign on for a full rebuild. And it is going to be a full rebuild. And then the other question that's kind of lurking out there is, does Schneider, uh, does he survive, right? Does he get another bite at the apple? It and depends on who has had control all these years with those missed early round picks. Were those Schneider picks or were those Pete picks? It's a very similar thing to Mayock and Gruden because we know Gruden was making the picks. Well, I Mayock agree. set the board, Gruden made the picks. It, was it a similar thing in Seattle? I don't think it was. I think it's these are Schneider picks and the weirder dynamic is the ownership dynamic. And we don't typically talk about this on the show because it's it's just not it's just not territory where we tread. But Paul Allen died left the team to his sister and she basically has said look john and pete you know what you're doing you're running the team like de facto you're running the team so they're in charge right there's not a strong ownership figure right now in the seahawks you know brass headquarters war room whatever you want to say so if you erase pete and john like what's left of the decision making structure and the answer is largely nothing you are at a clean slate you do not have an experienced football owner um who is able to make those things and is largely going to have to lean on someone else to do it or is probably going to be uh want to do that so the the desire to keep schneider despite the fact that his draft success has not been great it's going to be strong because you're going to be losing a lot of experience in that building if you do all three again russ pete and john schneider so it's a strange situation. It bears watching. The most likely thing I think is Pete goes, Russ, well, Russ goes first, Pete goes next, and John persists as the GM because he's all that's left of the sort of decision-making brass at the Seahawks. So John Schneider, Nathaniel Hackett, <laughs> Malik Willis. It would Full be circle. It would be full circle. Fascinating. <laughs> I I would sign up to see it because again, that might be bad but entertaining. And that's okay. Like for any rookie quarterback. If you're entertaining as a rookie quarterback, and Malik Willis is <laughs> he hits super entertaining. He hits the entertainment value right down the middle. I would go to you know, I would go to Lumen Field to watch Malik Willis, even if they're gonna get beat by thirteen, because he's gonna make some plays like that very few other players are going to make so it's possible but we're going to see some version or variant of that in seattle the big three will not roll it back like i would put folding money that not all three of those guys are going to be back next season yeah it's it feels like it's over yeah uh three interesting number one uh, we've talked about it quite a bit on the pod recently but i really want to hammer it home um the eagles can run on anybody and I find it interesting, to use the operative word, that it doesn't matter who they play against. Mm -hmm. The Saints are one of, inarguably, the top three run defenses in the entire league by every metric you can possibly point to. Early down run success, DVOA, adjusted line yards, 
drive success rate, like it, they are the dudes. And the Eagles put up 242 rushing yards on them. Jalen Hurts had three rushing touchdowns. He is as dynamic a runner as it gets in the NFL. He does it differently than Lamar, but I both think that they are similarly effective as runners. Jalen's a little bit more of like a, is it possible to be a slashing runner as a quarterback? Because when he when he plants that foot and gets up field, it's you know it's just like a cutback on outside zone for a running back, like that kind of Arian Foster dead leg. Plus, he's also you know two hundred. 25, 230 pounds, and he's got a lot of power to him, and he squats 650, so he's just hard to tackle, period. Um, has not had to throw for a lot of yards, but I don't necessarily see that as like a a detriment. You know, teams are, are holding against Jalen Hurts of like, oh, well, he's he's barely had to throw, and it's like, well, yeah, because their run game's so damn good, and their run game is so damn good because Jalen is such a threat with his legs, so... You know, it's chicken or the egg type thing for me. Like, the offense works because of Jalen Hurts. You've got the resurrection of Jordan Howard. You have a hobbled Miles Sanders. you got Boston Scott. And they're putting up 240 yards on arguably the best run defense in the league. And hats off to that Eagles offensive line, by the way, which played yes. their asses off. Uh-huh. They we, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. They realized that they're bigger and stronger than everybody else. And they're leaning into that, and nobody can stop them. No, you got a bunch of bullies on that offensive line. And while you were saying, oh, it's it's due to Jalen Hurts, I was like, cough, cough, it's due to Jason Kelsey. Like, <laughs> they've unleashed that line. And one of the things that Kelsey, who is a very good player and has been for a long time, is exceptionally good at is center pulls. And there's not a ton of teams in the NFL that use center pull really effectively. There's a lot of guard pull. There's even occasionally tackle pulls. There's tight end pulls. There's all kinds of pulls, but not a lot of teams in the NFL really go deep into center pulls. The Eagles are all in on center pulls, and it's because they have Jason Kelsey. And you get that guy out on the edge and let him go hunting, and it's super effective. He will absolutely pick off linebackers, safeties, corners, whoever's out there. He will go hunting. And they're doing it now. And look, he's making all the calls. He's a super veteran center, and he loves to get out and hit people. You got Jordan Malata at left tackle, who is going to show up in another section of this podcast, but is way bigger and stronger than people, and is just like, you let those five dogs off the leash and go, go get them. Knock them right in the teeth. Like, you feel good about that? And they're all like, yeah, coach. And you're like, great. <laughs> and they're going out and they're literally mashing people. And to your point, doesn't matter who, like the saints marched into Seattle and literally before the game, you talk about bulletin and board material and things you don't want to do and whatever. They literally were like, Nope. Tomorrow Davis was like, you can't run on us. Forget it. Shut up. Like it's and not happening. And he <laughs> smacked them all game long and was like, yep. Told him about it. I told you beforehand. I'm telling you now you can't do this. And that is what the Saints' run defense has brought to opponents all year long. Philly was like, oh, yeah? We got five guys. You want to go? And they went, and they rolled up 242 on them. We talked about the Colts being sort of the status quo, the preeminent, the diamond standard of a run game in the NFL right now. They put up 264, right, on the Bills. Like, I would argue that the Saints are a tougher run defense in many ways than the Bills, they put up 242 on them. Like, they don't care. They give zero Fs at this point. They're just like, I don't care. We're going for We're going to run you over. And they're going to win games that way. And Sirianni and his staff are smart enough to say, this is working. Let it off the chain. We'll do everything else off of this. And right now, I don't care who you put in front of Philadelphia. They're going to put up 200 yards. You know, there was a lot of people that said, like, ah, oh, the Eagles have – you know, they, they, they beat up on bad teams because they really started running in the Detroit game. Sure. That was where, that was the difference. Like, they lost to the Chargers, barely. And then the very next week, they're like, you know what? We're going to we're gonna change what we do. And they didn't. They put up 44. They won by 38 points against Detroit. And they're like, wow, that worked really well. Let's do that again. <laughs> um, oh, no, they lost to the Raiders. That's what it was. They played the Chargers after the Lions. But, you know, then they roll into Denver. They run all over Denver who's a good defense. 
They run all over the Saints. So, you know, people are saying, wow, they only they only beat bad teams. Well, I look at them right now. They're five and six. They're easily in the playoff hunt. And the rest of their schedule is Giants, Jets, Washington, Giants, Washington. And then they face the Cowboys in the last week. And the Cowboys, depending on how things fall, might be playing backups. Like, it's not a completely implausible scenario for them to go four and two or five and one over that stretch. And all of a sudden you're looking at like a 10 and seven Eagles team that's sneaking in the back door of the playoffs. And what do we always say is most dangerous in January? Can you run the ball and can you play defense? They can do both of those things. I think it is in the rest of the NFC East interest, which is five of their last six games to not let them in the playoffs because they will be a problem. They will wreck shop. They are they are that team right now that is playing very much in the Philly image. Like we are stand up, we're gonna smack you in the mouth. On defense, we're gonna smack you in the mouth. On the run game, we are gonna run over you. Like stand up. Stand up again. Let's go. And it's cool to see because it is sort of the antithesis antithesis of the modern NFL, right? It is that smash mouth. We are literally going to run you over. This is going to be physical. We're going to bury you. We're going to get as many pancakes as we can. We're going to step on your chest as we run towards the end zone. Like that has not been the typical way other than Tennessee's approach to win currently in the NFL, right? Little bit of little bit of the Browns, great offensive line, Nick Chubb behind that line churning out yards. Colts maybe. Well, yeah. Colts, but not until this year. Colts now, right now, yeah. yeah. So, and you have these teams that are emerging as powerhouses in what we have sort of described as a very level field where we don't feel sure about anybody. I think it was uh, maybe it was Mina or or Ben Solak or somebody. This there are no good teams, right? Everybody's every the, the kiss of death is saying somebody's a good team in the NFL because they'll go out and lose by thirty, and then we're like, what are we even doing here? <laughs> the teams that are emerging right now that you know through the course of the last couple of weeks and talking about this podcast, like the Colts playing really good defense, running the ball real hard, not passing the ball at all. Philadelphia playing okay defense i would say not as good as the colts but running a ball every bit is hard and you know this is how tennessee got into the playoffs last year with derrick henry they famously fizzled once they got there but they absolutely rode henry to the playoffs right strong running game they were hoping for good defense last year and again their defense approved this year but now they've lost henry this is a strange formula but teams that can do it yeah, you don't want to play them in December, especially outside. If it's windy and nasty and you go up against one of these teams, like, good luck. God forbid you get a January snow game against this run game. Ugh. Ugh. That's the last place I'd want to be as a defensive coordinator. That would just drive me insane. Yeah. Um, three interesting number two. Uh, math is weird. And uh, this is something where, you know, there's a lot of times we do we do three interesting. And really, it's it's something that we just couldn't fit in three up or three down. But we still wanted to talk about it. Like, this is truly a a three interesting nominee if I've ever seen one. Because you were going through uh, the AFC standings for a different segment that we'll get to in just a second here. And you notice something that when you look at the AFC North, the Ravens at the top. Seven and three, the Bengals six and four, Steelers five four and one, Browns in fourth place six and five. Somehow, despite the Browns having less wins than the Steelers, they're actually behind the Steelers and they're even with the Bengals because of that fifth loss, and so their win percentage is actually lower. And it's one of those like weird, quirky, like math things where you're like seven, six, five, six. Wait a minute. And it's the it's the tie that always gets me. And it's just one of those weird kind of quirky math things where your winning percentage is 550 versus 545. And you kind of have to like retrain your brain to realize that no wins isn't the only thing that matters. Uh, losses and apparently ties matter just as much. 
Yeah, it's just an odd thing to be reading down and be like, seven, six, five, six? Wait a minute. <laughs> and then you go, okay, losses three, four, four, five. Wait, they have more wins, but more losses too, and no tie. Like, pretty soon you get that little galaxy brain meme going. Uh, so a razor thin division, which leads very well into our next segment, but definitely a three interesting. There are three of the eight divisions in the NFL right now where all of the teams in the division are separated by two wins or less. And in the AFC West, it's one win. Like Kansas city has six. Everybody else has five. What this means for the league is that parody is rampant and it's wildly entertaining. They enjoy it because more fan bases are engaged later on in the year. Less people have booted their chances and stopped watching. And you're going to see massive changes. If a team loses one week, they could possibly go from first or second to fourth. And if they go on a two game winning streak to, you know, a week later, they could go from fourth to first and it could happen several more times, even though we're in the back half of the season. That's great for the league, right? It's maddening for fans to see these wild swings, but the league is just sitting there on Madison Park being like, oh, this is so good because everybody stays involved and it's exciting. Like it's super exciting to have your team. We're 12 weeks in now looking at we're only a game back at the leaders like we could do this thing everybody's doing the mental gymnastics and going through the rest of the schedule and saying no we can win this one we're going to take this one we'll probably drop that one that's going to get us to like everybody's doing that right now that's tremendous for the league they're super excited about this I was kind of going through uh, the playoff picture over on the NFL website and <laughs> you you could literally argue 75 percent of the AFC is in the playoff hunt. The Dolphins are kind of like a hard maybe at four and seven, but it's unlikely. I would say it's unlikely. Like possible, but unlikely. The Texans, yeah, for sure, they're out. Jaguars, for sure, they're out. Jets are, yeah, they're, they're all two and eight. They're done. But pretty much everybody from the Broncos up, because the Broncos are at 500 at five and five, the Raiders are at five and five, the Browns are at six and five, the Colts are at six and five, the Steelers are at five, four and one. They're the weird ones that are that are ahead of all the other six win teams, because again, ties make math weird. The Bills are a seven seed all of a sudden at six and four. The Chargers are at six and four. The Bengals are at six and four. The Chiefs and Patriots are at seven and four. You got the Ravens at seven three and the, the Titans at eight and three. But the Titans just lost to the Texans, so I mean, who the hell knows what's going on with them? Like, 75% of the conference is in the playoff hunt at Thanksgiving week. That is amazing for the NFL. That's amazing for the NFL. You compare it to the NFC, like, it, it, it's kind of weird how the NFC, there, there's, there's this cluster of teams that are in the hunt, and we don't really believe in most of them. <laughs> Whereas the cluster of teams that are on the, in the hunt for the AFC, we believe in all of them, but we know that mathematically they're not all going to get in. You know, it's like, do we believe more in Carolina at five and six, or do we believe more in the uh, in the Steelers at five, four, and one? Like, I, if the healthy Steelers, I kind of believe more in them than I believe in Carolina. So, but they're both bubble teams in the exact same spot in their respective conferences. So it's just kind of like a stark difference between the very very top heavy NFC and the very cluster fuckish AFC that nobody can predict either way. That's a perfect verb. I love it. Cluster fuckish. I'm going to use that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take that. Hope you didn't trade my pick. Cause that's, gonna, that's going to get common usage in my household. But uh, I think it's uh you know, we're what hour 40 into the show already. So we're running a little bit behind, but I do think that for all the people that have been patiently waiting, it is finally time for the bootleg shot of the week. I don't know what you brought to shoot this week, but uh, I, I brought your your people's water. I got to more do. I brought my people's water too. I went straight Jameson. So uh, not Jameson Black Barrel, which as most folks that follow the podcast know is my favorite. This is just straight old green bottle Jameson. No IPA edition, no stout edition, just like straight the stuff. And if you were around my house at Thanksgiving as I was growing up, like it was this and a bottle of Bushmills because we wanted to be 
uh, fair to both sides. Uh, for those that don't a, know, there is Protestant. So that's whiskey. a way to that's a way to phrase it. Yeah. There's Protestant <laughs> whiskey and there's Catholic whiskey, and and Jameson is the Catholic whiskey, and and um, Bushmills is the Protestant whiskey, and and anybody who debates that, it's like, well, look. Uh, you know, neither one of them hired anybody from the other religion for about 400 years to work at their distillery. So, yeah, it's a thing. Uh, not a thing here, but went with straight Jameson's. It is absolutely a Thanksgiving memory for me. Um, seeing the, you know, the bottle was out while people were cooking. It's an Irish family, a lot of people engaging in loud conversation and, and helping out around the kitchen. And, and so straight up Jameson is my shot of the week. But uh, we got to talk about last week's winner because... Uh, kind of one with a bullet, uh, one going away, whatever you want to say. And both of those things are appropriate based on the hit. Yeah. I think it was really the end zone angle of, uh, the Javon Holland shot on Devin Duvernay that really sold it. Cause when people, you know, from the wide angle, it's a good hit, but when you, when you watch it from the end zone angle and you see just how far Devin Duvernay flew off the field. I mean, he got launched like five or six yards by by Javon Holland coming in like a missile. That uh, that I think really illustrated just how damn good a hit that was. So uh, I want to raise a glass to you, Javon Holland, a rookie safety from the Miami Dolphins that's having one hell of a first year in the NFL. And uh, I think it's a sign of things to come. So cheers to you. Yeah, here's to range and impact. <sighs> Your people make an excellent product, EJ. They that. have a lot of practice, <laughs> and they do a fair amount of testing. Just saying, QA yeah. is, QA is not a problem. Quality assurance is is well handled. Uh, this week's nominees: number one, actually, we uh, should wanna, talk about the this. theme. We yes, have, there is a theme. We have a theme for the holidays, so it is. We're rolling into Thanksgiving. We're recording this a couple of days before Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving. It's a holiday to eat. It's encouraged. Like, maybe eat a little bit more than you should and enjoy the plenty. It is a holiday of plenty. And who loves plenty more than offensive linemen? So, <laughs> shot of the week this week is the Thanksgiving edition dedicated to the O-line. Whether you play now, used to play, still in the NFL, tearing people up, this is dedicated to the O-line. So, we have four submissions this week. All O linemen. So big heavies, thick sixes. This is for you. We're gonna start off with Wyatt Teller and an absolute mauling. <laughs> like you get an offensive lineman out on the edge. Wyatt Teller is a great one, and he gets to go hunting, and he did in this one. So Wyatt Teller opens it up. Um, he is followed by a guy we just talked about in Jordan Mailata, who is a very large human being playing great left tackle for the Eagles. And he had something I'm not sure I've ever seen before, which was a one-armed pancake, keeping the food theme of the Thanksgiving week. He basically shuffs off one defender, steps to the left, and goes, yeah, you too, huh, with one well, arm. hold on, hold on. You know who it was I that he do, pancaked it with one arm. Even more impressive. Cam Jordan, future Hall of Famer, badass extraordinaire Cam Jordan, Jordan Mailata, Put him on his ass with one hand. That's how big and strong this dude is. So when we say, yeah, the Eagles can run on anyone because they're bigger and stronger than you, it's because they have people like Jordan Mailata. Yeah, he basically looked at him cross and knocked him on his can with one hand. That's that's an amazing display by Jordan Mailata. And he's, he's a crazy athlete. Great story, um, but takes a very good Saints defender and just levels him with one hand. The next guy is no stranger to absolutely hammering people. Quentin Nelson uh, calling combo before this shot, right? If you're playing pool and you're going to put two balls in one pocket, you got to say combo or it doesn't count. It's junk, right? So Quentin Nelson decided that he was going to block one guy and he didn't like the other guy rushing either. So he was going to block his guy through that guy's legs and take out two for one. You know what? I, I don't have a favorite this week. Normally I have one that I'm kind of like in the back of my head that I'm rooting for. They're all amazing. I mean, Wyatt, Wyatt Teller stealing souls is kind of a regular thing for him. Jordan Mailata, you know, basically stiff arming a Hall of Famer to the ground. <laughs> Quentin Nelson doing Quentin Nelson things and Trent Williams doing Trent Williams. I mean, how can you, how can you choose? But That's I'm going to leave that up to you guys. 
Yep. If you go to the video version of the show on YouTube, some of some of our audio only listeners, we have like forty percent of our audience is audio only. If you go to the YouTube version of this show, uh, we've been throwing clips on here the whole time, and you can go take a look at that and cast your vote if you're so inclined. And uh, with that being said, let's get to our week twelve watch list before we get out of here. It is Thanksgiving week, and usually on Thanksgiving week we have a pretty good slate of games. This year is no different. New England, Tennessee is. Super intriguing because that could actually be a pretty big game for determining AFC seeding. New England is, surprise, surprise, definitely in play for being a first seed in the AFC at this point. I think there's only maybe three or four teams that they're likely competing uh, for that honor of getting a playoff bye, and they're right back to being New England, where, you know, they have a home field advantage throughout all of the playoffs and they go to Super Bowls and they uh, they they do Patriot things. So that game this week I think is super fascinating, watching the ascension of Mac Jones. Uh, Rams, Green Bay, super fascinating as well because you have the Rams that are extremely talented but kind of on the ropes after a couple bad losses over the last few weeks. Green Bay super beat up, but they're still ultra efficient. They still have Aaron Rodgers. They still have a great coaching staff. They're still somehow putting up 30 points a game despite all of their injuries. You have the Chargers and uh, the Broncos going at it. I would watch solely for Justin Herbert as if you need any other reason, but there's also a whole lot of great skill position players in this game. The Broncos, I think, have on most weeks a pretty good defense, so this should be a pretty entertaining game. And then uh, one last one. We have four games for you. Tampa Bay Indy because it's possible depending on if he plays or not. It's possible we are going to get Quentin Nelson versus Vita Vea, which is ultimate trench pornography. And if you care about football at all, you will watch this game just for that. Yeah, four good games this week. Starting at the top, Titans-Patriots. We have Pupil versus Master, right? Mike Vrabel, who learned uh, at the altar of Bill Belichick, going back to do battle with his mentor. But the Pupil has to do battle without his magic weapon. Derrick Henry is on the sideline. So what can Vrabel come up with? This is a Belichick staple, right? No matter who's on the field, no matter who the opponent is, I'm going to craft a plan to maximize what I have and beat the opponent on any given week. Can Vrabel do that? Has he ascended to that level or is he just really dependent on his one sort of big sword? We'll see. Rams, Packers, playoff implications all the way around. Like, Rams are in an interesting place. Packers are in an interesting place. These are two of the teams that are going to be there at the dance at the end of the year. Want to see how they do against each other for sure. Chargers, Broncos, Herbert on one side, but the Broncos on the other side just locked up Tim Patrick and just locked up Cortland Sutton. Uh, Tons of skill position players on both sides, but this could be the sort of track meet fireworks game that is an AFC West hallmark. Going to watch just for the chance that it is. Indy Tampa, thoroughly fascinating. Good run defense against great running team right now. Uh, Tom Brady righted the ship against the Giants. No surprise there. Uh, What's he going to do against Indianapolis, especially if they can't pass? Um, Tons of good football. And there's other games that are going to be wildly entertaining, even if they're not great. So the Thanksgiving week and weekend are setting up to be some really solid football viewing. It's uh it's been a hell of a week of football and I think week 12 is going to be no different and as the season goes on and we get to the last, you know, final third of the year with all these teams kind of crammed together in the playoff race, I think we're going to get some crazy crazy football. So I can't wait. I want to give a, a special shout out as well to the Bootleg Hall of Fame, all of our producers, executive producers I should say, Marat Consti, Caden, you've now joined the Hall of Fame, so I want to give a special thank you to you for hopping on this week. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without all of your guys' support and uh, everybody who's continued to support this show for the last, what, two years that we've been doing it. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. So thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back next Wednesday, I believe, with our Week 12 Thanksgiving week uh, extravaganza recap, whatever you want to call it. And uh, until then, later. Take care.